served as a docent providing tours for families and at the High Museum of Art. She is currently working on a PhD in writing and rhetoric at George Mason University. And there you can see Shante in the bottom right corner of my screen, maybe on yours as well. So we're really pleased to have Shante here. And finally, I have to say, I am pleased to introduce my boss or half boss, I'm not sure, but one of my bosses <laughs> at CSU, the Alan F. Rothschild Distinguished Chair of Art. Um, he's been a great addition to the art department uh, in the last two years. Prior to this position, he served as the Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer at the Cleveland Institute of Art. Chris also served as the Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean at the Maine College of Art. And we were both in Maine and somehow never crossed paths, but we crossed paths with a lot of the same artists, evidently, after some, several discussions. And he also was the Dean of Academic Services at the Maryland, Maryland Institute College of Art. And at MICA, this is something that I found really interesting, a little known fact. While at MICA, MICA he co-curated a show and now this might become part of the discussion, Juan, so be ready for these questions, <laughs> called The Narcissism of Minor Differences, which included a work of Juan Logan titled The, Pro the Proletarian Mother Tossing Flowers at Her Homosexual Son's Grave. I don't know if you remember that, but that is the title of your piece. I don't think it's in this show, though. I've been following you all these years, Juan. <laughs> finally so, caught you. <laughs> I'm going to let a few people into the that are keep coming in here. So, um, so without further ado, we're going to let Juan start the discussion out, showing some um, background and a brief kind of overview of his own work. And after that, we'll begin a kind of roundtable discussion between Shante, Juan, and Chris. So without further ado, Juan, take it away, and I'll share your PowerPoint. Give me a second here. Thank you so much. Let's and it's see. great seeing Chris. I haven't seen him in forever and ever. That's right. And it's uh, always good seeing Shante as well. Yeah, you, you guys know each other. There we go. So the things that I will share with you this evening are cover many, many years. And it, well, not so many, but um, the last 30 or 40 years uh, in a way. And um, so just pulling out a few things that uh, will give you a sense of where I've been and and how I got there and, and those kinds of things and the the things that I talk about in my work. So I'm ready to start anytime you are. I am too, but somehow it's not going up. <laughs> Another technical error. Hold on here. It worked just the, yesterday. So uh, let's see. Google Drive. Give me a second here. Uh, no, let's see. Hmm. Well, we might not be able to. Hold on. Give me a second. Sorry, sorry. We just had a slide show up. Let's say, let's say desktop share. Oh. Right. Give me a second. I'm almost there. There we go. Yeah, there well, we are. Let me shut this for you. Somehow it just locked us out of that first. The, there we go. Can you see it now? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Sorry about the delay there. That's quite all right. Uh, this piece, this is actually a collaboration with uh, my grandfather. Um, he did his part uh, March 25th, 1916. And then I later did my part in 2002. Um, the small bottle there was given to me years after it was done. This, it includes a small piece of bread and a letter. And the letter basically says, please save this. This is the last piece of bread my mother made the day before she died. So that was my great grandmother making bread for the family. So when I was given that, I called the breadboard for that to rest in. And it's, it's sort of the whole notion of what reliquaries are about anyway. You know, a place to hold those things that are held sacred. And in this case, uh, it will remain in the family for the duration, I suppose. Um, that's really what this is about. And it's sort of a nice jumping off point, thinking in terms of uh, growing up with my grandfather, particularly. Um, he was primarily a wheat and corn farmer and that sort of thing. And I spent lots of hours with him. Um, and he made everything. Uh, we didn't always have money to buy what he needed. So he and his son spent time making the things that they needed. And I sort of learned from that as well. 
Go ahead, Mike. You know, and again, because my work is so involved in so many aspects of uh, this American culture of ours, it's so easy to talk about and perhaps, well, it's, let's put it another way. It's not necessarily easy to talk about, but it's important that we talk about the things that are impacting us on a daily basis. In this case, this is a piece entitled Unconscious Bias. And, you know, again, I did this about the same time I did the other piece in 2002. And this, I cast about 1,100 uh, wax heads of Aunt Jemima. I allowed her to morph from being very, very dark to very, very light until she's almost transparent, um, just as the Aunt Jemima was before she was removed recently. Uh, her hair became straighter, her features, features keener. And, but, and all those kinds of things. But what this is really talking about is the article that was in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it really was interesting because it was a survey of about 1,500 cardiologists. And the only thing that varied in the survey was race and gender. All the cardiovascular problems were the same. And what they found is that about 98% of the times for those same cardiovascular problems, white males were referred to specialists and African-Americans and white females were given medicine and sent home. And when the doctors were shown the results of the survey, they said, well, it's not being done intentionally, so it must be an unconscious bias, hence the name. So I, I looked at this in terms of my own family. And when my father uh, was having a heart attack, we called the doctor and the doctor said, I would love to come see you, but I just got ticks to this baseball game. It's the last game of the season and it was a local game and he didn't come. So my father died a couple of hours later. My aunt Estelle, and aunt Estelle was my daughter's favorite aunt. Um, she would see a doctor here in town, was given medicine and sent home and she was dead about an hour later. And then my cousin Junior, and Junior was that favorite cousin. I mean, that truly, truly favorite cousin. You know, he gave me liquor to drink way early in life, talked about women and drove fast cars. I mean, how could he not be a favorite cousin? <laughs> So there he was checking out of the hospital in Charlotte and I was there to pick him up and he was complaining of chest pains and sweating profusely. And the nurse said, well, listen, when you get home, just take an antacid, you'll be fine. He died in the front seat with me about a block from the hospital. So that was unconscious bias playing out in my life in real terms, in real time. And I think many of us have suffered through those kinds of things. We're fully aware of what takes place and how it takes place. Next image, please. Next one. And if you if you don't mind, could you go back one? Yeah. Please. Thank you. I wanted to say that the thing that was really interesting about this as well is that it was being shipped from one museum to another museum. And unfortunately, they weren't necessarily packed correctly. And then they set them out on the docks, waiting for the shipper to pick them up. So he picked them up, tossed them in the truck, but because these are all wax, all but about mm. 25 of them shattered. Mm. So when they arrived at the next institution, uh, I got this call, you know how folks will call you and talk really, really slow. They said, well, Juan, listen. <laughs> and that's when you know something's wrong. But in any case, that's what happened to this. So even the insurance company sent them all back to me. Yeah. But next image, please. This, this one. Piece, I mean, really gets into the whole notion is, no, go back one, that one. Uh, this is whose song shall I sing? And it raises the question, uh, should it be the Star Spangled Banner or lift every voice and sing? One seeks, speaks of pride and dignity and self-respect and the other speaks of maintaining a stereotype and doing everything they possibly can to keep people sort of in their place, if you, if you will. I'm sure many of you have looked at all the other verses of uh, Key's poem and what it really, really talks about. And it's not about us in a very favorable way. Next image. This is uh, one of my larger heads. It's five feet tall, about four feet wide. Um, and it's made of tin from my grandfather's barn. And then of course that play a piano disc on it. And maybe by my song, it's talking about identity and recognition. And we are categorized, talked about uh, in many ways because of the music that we listen to. 
And again, that's been going on forever as well. The whole notion of how we shape this American culture of ours and how, how we participate in it and our contributions to, to it are all tied to these kinds of things. And yet they are used often against us. Next image, please. So you, you look at this and, and sure you think in terms of what it is you have to, you know, the title of the piece is by any other name. I'm sure many of you get that, right? May I see the next image? Just a close up of it. You and see. it really is about by any other name. So what do you have to see to see me is really what I'm asking. I was doing a, uh, when I was doing a residence at Cola Company uh, in Wisconsin, uh, we were casting a lot of iron and I was in my clothing for that. And I was having lunch and this woman saw me across the room in the restaurant and she was getting ready to empty her, her waist there in the trash receptacle. And I was probably 30 feet from her, but she went back to her table, which was about six feet away, picked up her purse and then went back to empty her trash. And I said, you know, we're fast. We just aren't that fast, seriously. I said, you are afraid of me. And yet I could be the guy that could save your life. Next image, please. Hopefully many of you have seen this piece in the exhibition. It's entitled, Help Me, Save Me, Love Me. And I was really talking about Katrina at the time. And it always felt like a, this huge puzzle had been taken apart that we couldn't get back together again. But it also talks about um, FEMA, the Red Cross, the Superdome, all those things that were intended to help people, but actually didn't. So you find people migrating around the Red Cross, around the Superdome, and FEMA just wasn't there. I mean, not in the way that they should have been. And in doing this piece, you know, I, I decided I would use puzzle pieces to talk about these things, um, since it was this big puzzle. And to give you a sense of where this is coming from, may I have the next image, please? Just a close-up of that, so you can see where how I work with these things and thousands of pieces, thousands and thousands of pieces. And the next image, please. So here are people waiting outside the Superdome, waiting to go inside. And this is the whole notion of where the puzzle pieces came from. In blowing this image up, may I see the next image? It pixelates in what looks to me like puzzle pieces. So it seemed really, really appropriate to go down that path and use them this way. And it's interesting too, in, in looking at this, you know, we always imagine that we would be there when the people would be there to help us when we call them. And it doesn't matter who the us is. Because, And again, understand that when I talk about who we are as an American culture, I'm talking about all of us. And I think it becomes really, really important to acknowledge that. May I have the next image, please? So with that in mind, this is I'll Save You Tomorrow. This is in the exhibition as well. And on the right side, you have that inverted boat. It won't save any of us at all. And on the left side, you have this red cross covered in, in white pearls. And the whole notion of the role that we, the thing we always hear our legislators say when there's a, a a disaster of a massive number of victims involved in one way or another, even regarding the recent shootings in America. So we're going to pray for them. And I always say, well, hell, we don't need their prayers. What we need is action. Could you stop praying for a while and just, you know, do what you need to do to help us? Any and all of us, if that's what's required. Next image, please. This becomes really important in thinking of Faulkner. You know, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And the whole idea that things continue to play out over and over and over again. And we would think by now that some of them would have been solved. We would be interested enough in even simple things like gun control for whatever reason. I can't imagine that. Um, but what do we have to do? 
again, speaking of us as an American culture, all of us and the impact that it has on all of us. Next image, please. So here we are, this is Jamaica, 1837. And this treadmill uh, was also used in Charleston and almost identical. And you notice that the, the people that are there, they're tied on, they can't really let go. So if they fall down, they simply hang on anyway. The two trustees are down there beating them with a cat of nine tails to make sure they continue to walk. And then that board that extends out in front of them keeps them upright so that they will tire really, really quickly. You know how we walk on that treadmill, we can sort of lean into it and last forever, it seems. But you also notice that it's not really operating anything. It's not, there's no task being fulfilled by this treadmill. It's just a way of punishing people and breaking their spirit. So in looking at this and thinking about this, um, I created my own sort of sugar house, which is what it was called when it was in Charleston, South Carolina. May I have the next image, please? So this is sugar house and the painting is about six by 16 feet. Um, again, made up of puzzle pieces and acrylic paint. And in this case, lottery tickets. So you see that hand on the right, that that's the hand of that banker in this case, holding on to that brass ring, which is what we all need to succeed supposedly, but he's collecting people. And all those, and when I mean, you think about the last banking, last banking debacle and where all the houses were underwater and that sort of thing, uh, basically the bank ended up owning us. And as we move to the, to the left, that treadmill in this case is made up of all lottery tickets. Those who can afford it least are the ones who play it most. There was a lottery in Delaware and one in Texas where I think it was a, a $100,000 scratch off and people were spending their money. I mean, their rent money, their food money, everything. Um, so that they could buy that lottery ticket only to find out that the grand prize had already been won. They couldn't win. The states did eventually change their policy there uh, to notify people when the grand prize had been won, but still an awful affair, it really was. And then as you move on to the left in this, those white clouds uh, with sort of that cellular structure inside is dealing with the whole medical industry. More times than not, the way, the reason we suffer as we do um, it's because we don't have insurance and they're not often willing to accommodate us because we don't have insurance. So, uh, I remember once being in the hospital and I was having this, all these tests done to check on my heart and that sort of thing. And they couldn't find anything at all. Couldn't find anything. And I was in there for four or five days and they were running tests supposedly. And at the end of it all, they said, well, we couldn't find anything. Uh, but if something happens again, just let us know. And about, oh, I don't know, within six months, um, I had a heart attack and had five bypasses done. But of course, in the previous hospital, they couldn't find anything. Interesting affair, really interesting. Next image, please. Just a close up of that. So you have some ideas of what I'm talking about when I say that I, I truly do use thousands and thousands of pieces of puzzle. Next image, please. This image uh, is part of a suite of etchings entitled Ghost. And what I'm really talking about is how this ghost is sort of alive and well today. And the role that it played when it was really in real life, if you will, impacts us in many people in much the same way today. It really does. May I have the next image, please? And you look at these and they're really sort of quiet images. We worked on these for about 10 years actually to get them the way we really wanted them to be. And they are quiet and subtle, uh, but I also think that they, in that subtlety, um, it sort of speaks of the insidious nature of how they exist today. Because at the end of the day, may I have the next image please? This is what they were coming from. Oh yes, people are still shackled today in various ways, educationally, economically, housing. There's a very, very long list of how these things uh, still capture us, hold us in place. 
And keep in mind that when I say us, I'm talking about all of us, all of us. Not just black and brown. Because you see, it's almost impossible you know, to use these and at the same time not hold yourself in place. Because you're expending a, you know, a, a lot of energy to make it work out just that way. I'm looking at what was happening uh, recently with all the states changing their laws. They're putting forth a lot of effort to keep a lot of people from voting. They could be doing things that are far more, far more productive for all of us. In this case, Jesus Christ. Sorry. That's all right, right there. <laughs> in doing this, and when you look at the, the basketball goals that are in the Bartlett Center, um, what's happening here is that I'm talking about how, we, how our youth get used and how we tag them early to use them. You know, I was, my daughter told me one time that I really need to lighten up when I talk about things. I was doing a talk for this museum. She said, so, well, you know, you may want to lighten up just a little bit. And I'm saying, really? For real? Because, see, I know the guy that I'm talking about here, all the kids that I'm talking about here. In the middle of this, and you can barely see it, there's a thing that says age 13, age 12, age 9. Because we tag these boys and girls, girls really, really early. And I'm using a cattle ear tag here. And with that basketball hoop, the shadow that's being cast almost becomes a halo because we expect them to be our saviors. They're going to save the school, the coach, the family, but not always themselves. Next image, please. This is the front of Foundation. And Foundation was done, uh, I guess it was 2004, I believe. And this is the front of it. It's looking at the limestone foundations of our municipal buildings. And in looking at them this way, they're always sort of clean and pristine and beautiful. And I always thought that was really, really great in seeing them that way. But you also realize very, very quickly that we're not looking at who's actually holding it up, which is what the backside is all about. We'll spend a lot of time putting that foundation in place, ensuring the success of this country. Next image, please. And, and this piece, and again, you know, the title of the piece is Sun Clouds Are Darker, and it's in the, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and it's really looking at the whole notion of how um, looking at the not only us being held in place, you know, but when we first came to this country. But I imagine that all those folks who passed away, their souls went into this earth and with that sun and the heat and the moisture, it pulled us into the sky. And when we rain back down, you know, we one created darker clouds and our raindrops were always dark and black. Some clouds are darker. There's no way around it. And the next image, please. And this is my studio. It's a fun place to work. It really is. Uh, it's interesting that you can see uh, I'll Save You Tomorrow and um, Help Me Save Me Love Me on the uh, right side there. Um, but I was just in there today packing work, as a matter of fact. Um, but I worked seven days a week in the studio and it, um, it's always great getting in there, spending time. It really is. Next image, please. And I wanted you just to see, this is a public piece I did for a museum in Charlotte for the Harvey B. Gantt Center and designed the, the plaza, the uh, beacon that go, went on the plaza. And the next image, please. And this is how it really turned out. Uh, it's made of black wasabi granite and the other granites that are part of the plaza itself as well. And the next image. So that gives you some idea. And the thing that's really sort of interesting for me in doing this, and is I always talk about it in terms of uh, how we approach public art, that we never say, no, we can't do that. 
when this was designed initially, it weighed about 70,000 pounds. They said, well, you have to get rid of about 36 or 38,000 pounds of it because there's a six story parking lot going underneath it. I said, well, can you do that? I said, well, of course we can, <laughs> no doubt about it. And of course, in that moment, I didn't know exactly how we wanted to do it, but I figured we could. Um, and we did, you know, we ended up breaking it up into smaller pieces and hollowing out the inside of it and all that. But listen, thank you for looking at these and I look forward to your comments and questions as well as we move forward here. We have a lot of questions. It looks like Shante has a first question here because I don't know if we can try Do you want to try to be direct muted? Just shake your head. Yeah, her mic's still not working. So nope. she, she says your artwork, um, your artwork as social abstraction uses a lot of imagery that allow the viewer to make connections to the elements inside your artwork to, to concepts in our real world. How do you develop some of this imagery? What is the process like? I hope I said that right for you, Shante. <laughs> <laughs> I think the process is tied to looking at who we are as this, if I talk about this American culture again, because uh, it informs me, I love information. And I think because of that, I'm constantly looking at uh, what takes place, how it takes place, why it takes place. And again, I spend more time posing questions, I think, than providing answers. I'm looking for my own answers sometimes, most of the time. Rarely am I trying to provide answers for anyone. Uh, so I think the, the whole notion of what it is that I do is simply raise better questions. I always, I've always felt that if you can ask better questions, you can deepen your investigation. So I try to ask you know, better questions. I think that really is the process. Great. Juan, I had a question. I, I was looking at your work, you know, I, I'm gonna just come out and say, I think your work is completely stunning. It just, just floors me, your work floors me. Thank you so much. Peter. So thank you, you're quite welcome. So I was thinking about today earlier about the role of the aesthetically compelling in your work. And I wonder, um, I wonder if it's possible that something could be so beautiful that it deflects away from the content of the piece mm -hmm. or allows people to, to uh, interact with the piece on the level mm -hmm. of beauty and the aesthetic and that sort of thing. And and, and give it in a way can provide an excuse for not going into the content, you know, of the work. The, of the work. Does that does that make sense? It does. It makes all the sense in the world. I think what happens is that um, years ago, and this is going back, you know, uh, thirty years or better, um, the work was more didactic. Perhaps I wanted to make sure that the viewer was actually getting it. You know, I had a point to make, mm -hmm. and I wanted to make sure they understood that point. And then concluded basically what you were saying that aesthetics were probably more important in terms of providing a different level of access to the work that I can. Uh, and plus, I, I think I was also growing up <laughs> in a way, maturing as an artist. And I realized I didn't yeah. have to say things quite that way. I could be far more subtle in my approach uh, to whatever it was I was examining. And it left the door wide open for people in a way. Uh, so I was more about that as time passed. Um, and, and again, I, go ahead. No, 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 please. Sorry. And, and again, I, I think more importantly, it was about trying to provide myself with avenues for me to explore. Because in being didactic and being direct, I sort of cut off all the other uh, pathways. And whereas if I could be more subtle, uh, there were simply, I, I could see more uh, on that path than I could have otherwise. So in a way, the work is uh, on some level, uh, the definition of the sublime, right? It pulls mm -hmm. us in and, and then we're terrified by what we see or what we learn. Sure. You I know? think that happens all the time. It really yeah. does. So going back to this idea of didactic, uh, just to, something that crossed my mind, I noticed, at least in this exhibition, many of the works that are sculpturals seem, seem to be a little more didactic than the paintings themselves. Mm -hmm. The paintings themselves seem to have this reflection on high modernist aesthetic values, um, but with this social abstraction message, that, you know, Shante is talking about. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and why that happens or if you know why that happens or i do i, I understand why it happens <laughs> I, I think because with sculpture um it sculpture doesn't provide the same level of flexibility for me it doesn't anyway i'm sure for some it does but for me it, it's never provided me with the same level of flexibility that uh, 
2D work would uh, or does. You know, you look at, think about a drawing, you think about paintings, you think about prints, uh, even video all provide a, a different kind of aesthetic that you can play with. You can provide more avenues, you can explore it or provide more openings, if you will. And sculpture is sort of hard and fast, yeah. uh, both in terms of process. Uh, you have to be pretty sure about what you're doing, where you're going with it and how it's going to exist once it's finished. Uh, you don't get to play with it in the same way. You just don't. Uh, and I think that would probably explain it best in terms of why they are clearer in a particular way um, more to the point. Yeah, as the ones back here. I mean, I, I had that experience with viewers through this space already. They, they seem to really understand the works here. I think they're seduced by the paintings in the front, uh, to say the least. So, so Shante has a question. Um, let me make sure I can zoom in there. In 1960s, uh, the 1960s is a time in art that's overshadowed by the civil rights movement. And the art that we most hear about during that time of Afro or uh, Afro Cobra in Chicago as part of the Black Arts Movement, which is known as the sister arm of the Black Power Movement, can you talk about your experience as an artist in the 1960s? Sure, it was interesting times. I mean, truly interesting times. I uh, during those years, I made a painting titled "I Am Black" because I wanted folks to be really clear about who I was and how I saw myself and I wanted them to see me that way. Um, and most of my paintings were sort of tied to those kinds of things during that period. Um, one of my favorite uh, people, you know, remains so today was Floyd Coleman. He was one of my instructors uh, early on and a mentor and a wonderful painter, but his paintings were always charged that way, uh, full of that kind of energy, if you will. And, but I was also told by curators and folks who saw my work during the uh, 60s and early 70s that uh, my work wasn't black enough because it was far, far too abstract and it didn't go down those hard, angry paths that they were looking for, as if they were looking for something in particular uh, along those lines. And yeah, again, it's simply where I was, who I was, and I was trying to be true to myself um, and sort of have tried to remain that way over all these years. I think I made my first sculpture, oh gee, that's, I guess that's almost 60 years ago. You know, so I've been at this a long time. Juan, you know, the um, talking about the 60s and I've been thinking lately, I think about it all the time, you know, just in the last two weeks, how many black people have been you know, murdered on the streets. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it makes me, so you've been doing this for this work for 60 years. And I think a lot about the efficacy of art mm -hmm. or what is the efficacy of art in actually affecting change and making things move. Mm -hmm. So could you speak to that a little bit? Sometimes, I've, in all honesty, sometimes I feel like it's a little toothless in a way. Mm -hmm. Like my work, for example, um, I just, I don't understand entirely how how art changes the world, how it makes it a, a better place on that social level that you talk about so eloquently. You know, I, I think that we have the opportunity to put things in front of so many people. Uh, we allow them, it's sort of like thinking of a shaman in a way. A shaman has mm -hmm. the ability to divine the hidden, to show us things that we would not otherwise see. So I think artists sort of function in that, that way they're trying to show you things that you would not otherwise see because it's, it's never imagining these things were happening around you because you just weren't looking for them. Mm -hmm. It's not that they weren't always there for you to see. It's just that you couldn't at that moment. But once you see it, you cannot not see it. Yeah. And I think that's what's happening today in terms of where we are. And it's, it's what we've done forever, you know, over the decades. Uh, we've always put forth an effort to try to show you who we are, what we're doing, why we're doing it. And I, I was thinking of a piece that I did um, uh, regarding 2014 and it's called Waiting. And it's, I'll, I'll send you the image, you know, of the piece, uh, but it's a group of uh, prints that uh, have all the names, the dates that they, were di that they died for all these boys and men that were killed in 2014 by police officers. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it all, it says, 
you know, I'm still waiting. Mm -hmm. It says Michael Brown is still waiting. Tamir Rice is still waiting. I mean, there's a long list there. And at the end of it all, it says we are all still waiting. Yeah. And here's, here's George Floyd. Yeah. And, it keeps, and it keeps going. It doesn't stop. It hasn't stopped over all those years. And before that time, of course, for the decades before, it hasn't stopped. It has continued. And that's what's so alarming about it. And I was doing a talk recently for a city and we were looking at the whole notion of how things and why things remain as they are. I said, but you have to look, point the finger in the right direction. I said, we, you are supporting the policies that you put in place. We don't have the power, nor have we had the power to put the policies that you are using you know, to address your audience, you know, the, the citizens of this town I said, you put these policies in place, so the only way they're going to change this will be for you to change them if you're really right. interested in them being changed. Right. So we say, what can I do? What can you do? What do you want to do? And that's really what it comes down to. So, yeah, I, I think you, you raise a good point, though, that it's never easy. It is ongoing. But I think that we have decided, because we don't have any options there, that we're not going to stop. We're just going to continue working at it and doing it and working at it and doing it until change does come. And whoever said it would be easy anyway. Well, and there's a, a book called Afflicted Powers uh, written by a group in San Francisco called Retort. And the, the book was about what about 9-11 or at least starts with that. And uh, they claim that the war was actually a war about images. Mm -hmm. And with the bombing of the Twin Towers, the other side completely won, won on that, on the level of imagery, right? And, right. you know, George Bush standing on a flight deck in a fluorescent orange shoot suit, that wasn't, right. it didn't, it didn't, it wasn't a sufficient reply. So maybe, you know, with the cell phone imagery, you know, with artists, the imagery of artists, yeah. maybe things do start to turn slightly or ever, ever so slowly, but they do start to turn, you know? Well, I think what we've always done, and I think we will always continue to do it, is that we we make it, we bring it forward. We show yeah. you. Yeah, and I mean, I've heard, and I'm sure all of us have in one way or another, folks say, well, you know, I never really thought about that. And I'm saying, well, why not? Yeah. It's been around you all these years. Nothing's changed, you know? And the George Floyd moment made people so aware of what it is we are talking about, what we have been talking about, and why this is so important. And it's unfortunate that it had to play out that way but it raised a, a, to people to a level of consciousness that they hadn't experienced before. Yeah, yeah. So. So I, I'm gonna speak for Shante. I'm, I feel terrible, Shante's there and, I'm, and she, she's got this very deep male voice all of a sudden that echoes. Um, but, uh, and I think she, I think he answered your question a little bit, that first one. So I'm gonna go to that second question there, Shante. It says, what are, and I think it's, what are some of the social questions you would like to answer about contemporary society that you have asked in your work or would like to consider? What are some of the questions you're asking about con this con or the contemporary moment or this contemporary moment? Well, I deal with uh, these days anyway, this whole series of elegy paintings that I'm working on. And I've worked on maybe, I don't know, 120 of them so far. Um, over the last few years and they initially they were dealing with the whole issue of immigration and then they almost thinking of elegies as being a poem for the dead let's start there i changed that in terms of how i was using it to think in terms of the loss of memory and the fragments that we're able to hold on to are the fragments that others are able to hold on to and i was looking at i did this painting that included about 5700 faces of children being held on our southwest border and how those 5,700 kids, and there's so many more thousands now than then, how they will not remember in many cases their language, their parents, their loved ones, culture, traditions. I mean, all those things will be wiped out in many respects. They won't be able to recall that at all because they're not only looking at family, they're not only looking at their culture or anything closely related to it. They've been told, I mean, and when we were doing that, this is when they were, I did those paintings when we first started separating people from their kids from their parents and that sort of thing. And then I looked at the folks I've known who've had 
dementia, you know, uh, or Alzheimer's and those kinds of things as well. And the things that were important that seemingly happened 50 years earlier. So what I'm left with in terms of painting, I'm left with bits and pieces, fragments of a moment, of a color, of a, a form. And even when I try to remember certain things about where I've been, what I was doing and all that, I don't recall the entire event, just bits and pieces of it. So that's what I end up expressing. So I so think beautiful. today, for me, uh, socially, how do we, I guess I try to recall those things, not only for myself, but for those, the people I spend time talking to. So I'm gonna swing us back around. We have a few more minutes. I think if anybody has questions, they can start putting those questions into the chat. Um, but I wanna come back to the creating and collecting theme of this exhibition, right? right. Um, and one thing I, I, I hinted at this and Didi did this with, with it was Didi and I, we really integrated this collection with your exhibition. Mm -hmm. We, we really, and I think she noticed this really right off the bat that, that this collection somehow has informed your aesthetic. And I was wondering if you could talk about that experience of collecting artwork and how it, it, it maybe if it happens through osmosis or if it just happens because you've been looking at this work for so long and then all of a sudden some of those aesthetic decisions are made in the work. Can you talk about that process sure. and how it informed those works? I, I think even when I mentioned Floyd Colvin earlier, I could also mention Leon Golub very, very easily, or Nancy Spiro. I could mention lots of people, uh, Rauschenberg. Um, oh. I mean, there's so many people that I could talk about, but um, Robert Colescott, mm -hmm. uh, when he talks about America and American culture, um, they all inform me in a particular way, not so much to in terms of replicating what they have done, but in terms of how they think, the questions they are raising and how they express those questions and are the answers that they are providing on some level. Uh, so I think that's how they have influenced me. Uh, by the same token, when I look at Ellsworth Kelly and the subtlety of line movement in his form sometimes, it, I find that really, really exciting. I know it's a simple thing, but I said, dang, that's nice, you know? And I think it's more about that for me in terms of uh, what happens on that page uh, with that line, that form. Uh, so influencing me to think about those things uh, more deeply, I think is, is the influence, if you will. Okay. But, I, I, oh, yeah. but to answer your other questions in terms of collecting, I, I wanted to surround myself with people that I simply in, enjoyed, that I thought were just really good artists, um, just because they were, and because I enjoyed the work. <laughs> that was really sort of the bottom line. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you've had an incredible career. You're a really great artist, as I said at the beginning of this. So my my sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a question, it's something I've been thinking about with respect to talking with you today. Well, at this point, what keeps you awake at night? I mean, what do you think about? What do you, what do you hope to achieve? Where do you think you're going next? I think the, as I've gotten older, Chris, I think about my ability or perhaps inability sometimes to do all the things I want to do, mm -hmm. not in terms of out there in the world, but in terms of creating work. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm sometimes concerned that I, I don't have enough time to do all the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. that I haven't explored mm -hmm. things deep enough. I haven't answered my own questions adequately uh, because I keep raising deeper, more meaningful questions. And yeah. so then I'm concerned with what that looks like visually and how can I talk about that and what can I do? And um, I was thinking today, not, I was considering the idea of that. I was listening to Hugh McCall who uh, worked with, he was the CEO of Bank of America. I was listening to him talk yesterday and he was saying that um, there's, there's so few things that I'm able to do by myself. It always involves the help the concern, the involvement of others. But I was also thinking about what we give away. And by helping someone, you don't lose anything by doing so. Yeah. You just don't. Yeah. And I think that becomes equally important of how we share the information that we've gained over all these years. And I was saying not too long ago, see, I love what I do in terms of making art. 
I love collecting art. I love all of that. But a friend told me many, many years ago, and I always try to repeat this to uh, be it an audience or young artists. I said, as good as art is, and art is absolutely fantastic, it really is. Rarely, if ever, will it take the place of a hug or a kiss. Wow. So we got, a couple, we, got a, we got a couple. That I mean, that's hard to, yeah, that's powerful. <laughs> we got a couple great um, questions here, but I'm going to start. Shante actually says something here that I think we've been skirting around, and I think we all seem to have an understanding or, or think we have an understanding of this, but she says, can you define social abstraction for those who don't know what it is? Because we've been talking about it, but we never really quite defined it for the audience. I always leave that to historians to come up those <laughs> I think that uh, when I, if, in using it that way, I'm simply using the abstraction to talk about social concerns. That's all. Uh, and Elizabeth Catlin and I were doing this show once and we had the opportunity to spend some time talking and we talked about the idea that she was saying that uh, it's a lot better for you to be social than it is to be political. Political simply means you're taking on a particular point of view. Social simply means that you're talking about the things that are happening around you. And you're commenting on those things as if you care about them. And I do. So, so because I spend more time creating things in an abstract manner, it's easy for me to play in that space between representation and abstraction. Uh, but I'm talking about the same things that that realist might paint uh, in dealing with that, in creating that narrative. It's just that my narrative deals with form, color, texture, and all those other things in a different way. That's all. Mm -hmm. So you got a question and I, and, and it's from an individual that says, um, your work with the puzzle pieces amazes me. Do you paint each one of them or do you collect them? Uh, you know, and maybe they haven't seen some of the work in person, but some of them have actual puzzle pieces. But I, I use real that. puzzle pieces, but I also uh, work with a firm who can make the things that I need to make. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have a you have a thank you from Bo Bartlett himself. He says, "Thank you, Juan. Such beautiful, important work. Love the exhibition. He was just in, I think, last weekend." Um, thank you. Through and he just I wanted appreciate to that. You have another comment here. Do you think that every um, uh, do you think that every question has or needs to be answered? I don't. Not by me. <laughs> and 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 certainly. If it means something to you, then you should take the time to explore it, to at least delve into it as much as you think you want to you know, find out the things you want to know about it. You know? And I think it's far better than being passive about things. I think so often we simply pass it because we don't want to spend the time investigating it and we lose out because of it. That's why I think oftentimes we know uh, so little about each other. There was so, something earlier today, one that you uh, a student, I think, told you that she or he had been working on a series, and you said uh, she had a. They had a question, so they started this series of work, and you said to her or him, "How many pieces have you made?" And they said, "I don't know, ten or something." Now on my new idea, and you said, "I had a question. I made 150 paintings, right? Right. So you're just going deeper and deeper into the. That's thing. true. That's yeah. so true. And I think that's really what it comes down to. Uh, it takes time, and it's okay. There's no, you know, I and I've sort of been this way for a long, long time now that I'm in no real hurry. It just takes as long as it takes. That's right. <laughs> so if I can finish the painting in two weeks, that's great. If it takes nine months, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the end of the world. So we have a, another question here by a, a former student actually. Um, says, you shared a very powerful statement about your experiences in the 60s, about your work not being black enough. and I. I think there it looks like a typo here, but I, I guess, can you talk about that experience? Like, why did you feel that things have to be classified in some way? I, I didn't. It's just that the curators did. That wasn't my concern at all. I was just doing my work and felt that the work would fit right in personally. Um, but they felt that it, uh, that was a period in our history when museums decided they weren't going to collect works by African-Americans. So it's sort of like collecting a Roy Lichtenstein painting, you want it to look like Roy, you know? So they wanted it to look black, for whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you're doing paintings that are very, very subtle and minimalist and so on and so forth, is that just as black as Robert Colescott? 
or someone else who's creating work about the same topic, it's just that I'm doing so in a very subtle, quiet way. Does it mean less because it's expressed that way? It doesn't. But it is often, often our inability, our ability to read that into the piece that we're looking at. So I think that's really what it comes down to. That was more there, yeah, you know, it's where they were coming from, not where I was coming from. So I have one more, and maybe it's more of a comment. Perhaps you might want to talk about it. Um, one interest I had about having this exhibition in the show was I immediately recognized that your work was a reflection of Americana, like uh, the reflection of the American culture in some way. Yeah. And Bo's artwork is too. There's no doubt about it. You can't walk in the center and not realize that th this work is about being American, probably more than any, or may maybe even more about being American in the South as well, right? And, and yours actually has a lot of those reflections too. I was, you know, and really my idea, and actually I think this might be, and behind me you might see this, one of the first times I think that I've been in the center where I've seen other works from artists kind of coexisting in the space with Bo's work. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if how you felt about that, or maybe if you were interested in that kind of dialogue between these works and these different perspectives in any way. Yeah, I think that's really important. And I think it's great that the works do work together that way uh, because it provides a, a, an entirely different perspective at all. I mean, completely. Uh, and the opportunity to look at both at the same time, I think is really important. I really do. Um, Bo is such a wonderful artist in his own right. And I think he explores topics that I also explore just in a very, very different way. Yeah, through a different lens. A different yeah, exactly, exactly. There's a, and, and there's something, you know, one reason we haven't, since I've been here, ever exhibited other artists' works with his work, because his works usually take up so much of the space, so much of the air, they, they take your attention. But somehow your works are really able to, to hold their own in the space in, in a way that um, it's, there, there's a definitely a, a clear distinction between the works, but also a dialogue going on right. between them. So we have a, another uh, question here by a artist, that, or a young artist that was just in here not a few, just a few days ago that I gave a tour to, um, Tony Pettis. He says, Juan, how do you balance the fatigue of both living as a black artist and telling the stories of black beings without being pulled back in? Or do you use that feeling to continue to create it? Well, I think um, the fatigue I feel is not so much tied to my work ethic. Um, I mean, I work seven days a week, so I don't tire of what I'm doing that way. I do get tired of having to, uh, I was doing a talk once and the guy at the end of the talk said, well, it looks like you're, you're preaching to the choir. And I said, well, I think after all these decades and centuries, you would be singing a different tune. I said, you leave me no choice but to continue to deal with these topics over and over and over again because you are the ones making the policies and you refuse to change those policies to make my life better. You keep these things in place in spite of. Not that you don't know better, you do. You just don't want things to change. And because we are not the dominant culture, you know, then we have to depend on the dominant culture to bring about those changes. So I think ultimately that's what it really comes down to. So you have another question. How do you feel about the attempts to classify black voices in such restrictive labels, both curatorially and creatively in, cor in correlation to the assumptions made about the black experience as a whole? Well, yeah, again, I'm not so much talking about the black experience as a whole, and nor do I think that's my job. I don't think that's anyone's job per se. I think we talk about this American life and I would think we bring our perspective into it because we are who we are. But I don't think we are relegating uh, us to a particular, a very, very limited pathway, if you will, you know, in much the same way that when Mark Bradford was talking about the whole notion of climbing a mountain, you know, does that become a black experience or is it just an experience? And when he talks about it, he talks about it as, a, as an American artist who's talking about something that he has experienced. Does it become black because of it? I don't think so. It just becomes his experience. 
he expresses it in a way that is tied to who he has been, who he is, you know, as an African American man. So I think that becomes part of it. But you can't escape that either. Well, it looks like the questions have stopped coming in. There's just been a couple of repeats, but other than that, um, and it's perfect timing. We've been about an hour and eight minutes at this point. Um, really uh, just an awesome discussion. Um, I have one last question for both of you and Chris. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this show, the narcissism of minor differences. <laughs> Go back to that. Do you guys recall that show? I do. Well, I can't say a word about it. Chris will talk about it. <laughs> uh, it's a, as, as I think everyone knows, it's a phrase that Freud used to talk about the fact that we want to think we're entirely different from everyone else or each group wants to think that they're entirely different from any other group, but that's really a function of narcissism, right? And so this, my co-curator and I started to do a lot of research and looking at a lot of stuff. We saw Juan's work, Juan's work. And, um, and we did, we went to the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC to do some research. And the day after we were in there, you guys may remember this, somebody walked in the front door and shot the place up and killed somebody sitting behind the front desk, right? It was the day after we were there. So, um, that's, that's what it was about. It was about intolerance. And uh, I think it really shook that school up a little bit because it wasn't, it wasn't an easy show to see. Mm -hmm. So, Well, at that, I want to thank all of you for bearing with us in the technical difficulties. Shante, I'm so sorry your mic didn't work, but you had great questions that kept great the question. dialogue rolling. And we really appreciate it. We really next time would hope to hear your voice. Um, those of you that haven't read Shante's essay, we have a link to it on our website, and we also have a link to it in our social media. And the, 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 or it's an interview, excuse me, between uh, Juan and Shante. Um, Chris, thank you. And Juan, thank you. We hope to see you here. Um, all of you, um, thanks again. Stay safe, stay healthy, and come to the Bartlett Center. This show is up till June 18th. And, it is a beautiful show and an amazing show. And I appreciate, again, your patience with us in those tech technical difficulties. So, also, so long. Dr. McFalls, remember, uh, we are recording for anybody who wants to wants to share. Yeah, so we will be, we have this recorded. So if you want to share, it looks like we had a good group today, about 50 people. So we will also, if you have any more questions, we will actually um, be printing out these questions and sharing them with Juan and Sean. And, and I did want to say also, uh, Mike, that uh, if you have any questions, you can always uh, get in touch with me, uh, direct message me on Instagram at uh, Juan.Logan. Or uh, follow me on Instagram at Juan.Logan. And Shante Juan. said the Thank same you, Shante. thing. <laughs> but you can, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Shante said the same thing. You can find Shante. She's, she's uh, especially in Burnaway Magazine, but you'll find her if you look her up. She's pretty much anywhere in the Southeast scene. Um, and I'm sure she'd be happy to answer questions. And it's unfortunately, we didn't have her voice here, but um, I was able to talk a little bit for her, I think. So, um, but good night. So long. Take care. Thank, Thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Juan. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you.